Hello again, one and all. We are back here in the Undead Crypt and are about to go knocking on King Vendrick's door. However, Velstat is not too okay with that, so we're going to have to make our way through him first. Come on. Ah, humbug. The ranging on that's weird. There we go. Oh, come on, let me get it. Nope. <sighs> that is one of the sad things about facing a pair of enemies at once, is that sometimes, even if you land the parry, the other one's going to be covering for him, so you can't actually go in and take it. So, you need to take one of them out and then come and deal with the other one. Like that. Criticals are extremely potent versus these Cyan Knights. Any sorts of parries or backstabs, even guard breaks. There's just such a wide variety of things to do that can really trivialize these knights. As they're standing up, just put them right back down. There we go. Let's see if the Great Axe parries stronger. I don't think so. Yeah, I didn't think so. But it still should be a one. Oh, it's not a one shot when he's standing up. That's strange. Well, let's just focus on the Bastard Sword then. Actually, the Guard Break Critical should do more. Yeah, like that. So, just pick the appropriate weapon. And, oh, mucked up that parry. Let's heal up and try again. These last two are nice because they just kind of wait for you to come to them. Yeah, get the nice setup there. You can swing away all you want. I'll just take that. Oh, come on. I was busy with your friend. Can the jump attack do it for me? No. Almost, though, so... It would have worked had he not been a backstab rather than a... Uh, parry or guard break. But, here we are with Velstat. He's got his just ridiculously large bell. There's, it is it is gratuitous. There's no reason for that. Stop it. Stop it, Velstat. You're compensating for something. As you can see, that parry gives you some free time to just diddle him a little bit. It's also extremely, extremely gratifying. I have just been completely infatuated with parrying bosses recently, and Velstat is no exception. He's one of the a uh, few bosses that you actually can parry and since he does so much damage with his swings it's actually one of the more worthwhile ones and by far one of the most end game bosses there are the throne defender and throne watcher that can also be parried but it's not as worthwhile because there's two of them so even if you manage to get a parry the other one's probably going to cover for the incapacitated one Oh, that backswing. I mean, I love it when I get the backswing, but when bosses get the backswing, then I just call BS. And I didn't have the reaction time there, but Velstat's almost down, so we can just parry him and send him off to his grave now. Yeah, you can see why I wanted the small shield. It really allows you to get those really great reaction parries as opposed to more setup parries like you need with a slower parry shield like the buckler or target shield. It's, the parry timing is just very nice on it and so it's just really fun to use and abuse in certain situations. Talk to her real quick and we're back to the bonfire. We've got a ton of souls, the king's ring, and now we get to head on through to Aldia's Keep and the Dragon Shrine and Irie Beyond. After I make a quick stop for levels, of course. I'm considering actually heading on over to the Undead Purgatory in order to pick up the last Sublime Bone Dust of the playthrough, but I don't really need it. I already have 12 Estus, so it's not going to be a huge deal. Yeah, that's right. I'm upgrading Int and Faith at this point. I'll need a little bit more attunement to make anything useful out of it, but I'm really just grabbing them for the dark and pyro and not pyro, but fire 
uh, damage that they give you. Pharos doesn't seem like he would just be a full melee build, so I want something special in there. A little bit of magic, more than a nary murmur of dark. Really, just make him a balanced character, because I don't want to be investing highly into vigor, endurance, and vitality. So I've got to put those stats somewhere, and making him have a little bit of magic, dark scaling, all those sorts of elemental things, seems like a nice idea. There we go. Kings ring that up. And back to the Ring of Blades. What's my vitality at? It is full 20, so I can't use uh, Flynn's Ring. Considering that I've got great weapons, I don't think it's necessary, so I I'm happy with the stat spread I have. Grab this Petrified Dragon Bone, lovely. These guys are always a pain in the butt since they have. <laughs> since they're tiny and they have the ability to petrify you. But if you have a nice sweeping weapon, you can make quite short work of them. They have a chance to drop Affinity and all the Black Knight weapons, so if you want to be dual wielding one of those or just want more casts of Affinity, then they are quite easy to farm, but again, be careful. They have the ability to do nasty, nasty things to you if you're not quite prepared for their numbers, their swarming ability, and their, whatchamacallit, nasty tendency to petrify you. Not to mention that they're so short, they're very difficult to hit. There's two items just lying about over here. The Radiant Life Gem and Wilted Dusk Herb, I believe. Something along those lines over here. Excuse me. No, just a Twilight Herb. But yeah, some nice free stuff. Might not grab it while we're coming on in and waiting for Azlatil. Takes forever to spawn, but I have a great axe that will make short work of him once he does. There's no way an NPC can poise through this unless they have infinite poise like Jester Thomas, so it just has the perfect ability to stun lock them. Just keep on hacking and you're gonna make short work of Azlatil in no time. You can actually completely skip this if you immediately start running and jump over that. The only item you miss out on is a fading soul, so I'm fine with leaving that there. It's 50 souls that I'm never going to need ever, so I can just immediately ignore that whole encounter and come up here, start looting the area, and facing some of the baddies over here. Great magic barrier, because you know you're, not, you're actually not seeing as much of that as you used to. It used to be just the go-to utility spell until they changed how bus stacking worked. And now you see a lot more people making the big investment ju for just Sacred Oath as opposed to Great Magic Barrier because it gives you more physical defenses as well as giving you boosted damage where most people, excuse me, as far as I've seen, prefer to go with a more glass cannon play style of just do as much damage as possible rather than play defensively with really, really heavy armor and, say, a uh, great magic barrier, which will likely block a lot more damage than the defense bonuses of Sacred Oath, at least if you're facing a build that has any sort of elemental damage involved. This guy coming on out. Because honestly, the 200 to 50 defenses that Great Magic Barrier gives you is absolutely insane when you consider that that's more than a quarter of the elemental damage right off the top. Because elemental damage reduction caps out at 900, 900 giving you 100%, the uh, 250 points that Great Magic Barrier gives you in all four magic defenses is just so useful. It's really big. I always get a little bit ahead of myself and try to hit him before he's vulnerable, but 
and it's really just going to break your weapon, so you really want to avoid that if you can. I know it's hard to wait, but he'll be here for you in just a moment. Give him some time to spawn. And now you can lock him into the sit-down cycle. Hack away at him while he's busy squatting. Dragon Acolyte Mask, once again, one of my favorite Fashion Souls items in the game. It's really great. Just, just love it. Love it to death. Come right in underneath him. Can get almost 2k damage before he has any time to do anything. Most of it's counter hits, too, because he's so zealous in attacking the air in front of him. Oh, no drops? That's sad. Usually he has pretty nice chances to give you some drops. Whether it's Petrified Dragon Bone, certain upgrade stones, or the Dragon Acolyte slash Sage Mask that he has a chance of dropping. Usually he gives you something, but no, he was greedy today. Grab these ascetics, and that's the entirety of the foyer for Aldia's Keep. Aldia's Keep is actually one of the really, really nice areas in that even the like ceiling and walls and oh, I didn't even know it was sort of broken in. But the ceiling and walls all have something there. There's things hanging about. There's a lot of decoration. It's not just a blank wall like this. A lot of areas have just very, very boring designs and very boring layouts with a lot of repeating textures, whereas Aldius Keep has things hanging all over the place. You do have these broad expanses of walls, but the texture repeat isn't nearly as obvious as it is in some of the other areas, and it's just a much, much better looking area than most of the places you find in Dark Souls 2. Sadly, that is one of the things that Dark Souls 2 doesn't do particularly well. I don't think it's much worse than Dark Souls 1, but the visuals, I would say, at least in terms of their aesthetic and design, are a bit of a step back. They might be a little bit better from just an objective standpoint of their better textures in general. Maybe there's better effects, but... As a whole, I don't think it stands up as well as Dark Souls 1, but then again, that could just be nostalgia talking. I haven't played Dark Souls 1 in a long time because, honestly, Dark Souls 2 is just such a much more fluid game. The mechanics are so much tighter. It just feels better to play, so I have to really find a reason to go back and play Dark Souls 1. That's the problem with live commentary. I had been meaning to take him down to low health so that I could have him come on over, break down the door to the, uh, whatchamacallit, malformed shell, as well as the um, enhanced undead abomination sort of thing that's down there. But because I was talking and not focused on what I was doing, I borked that completely and just killed him out of hand circle around. This gets the stagger. And I've got company. Oh, that lovely, lovely attack. I harp on it every time just because it's so horrible. It's like, really? What were you... Can I... <laughs> you can lock on to him from up from down here? That's surprising, to be honest. It is just such a grievous failing of this game. That little paw swipe they have. It's just a terrible, terrible move. I can't abide it. But anyways, that gets us the Aldia key. And a bunch of nice other things. What's my upgrade count at? Yeah, I've got 39 Twinkling, 27 Petrified Dragon Bone, and I haven't even been to the Dragon Irie yet. That should tell you how much the first DLC gives you, as well as the fact that I'm using two regular weapons rather than special titanite weapons. A little bit more. Get my Wanderer's coat, Jester's gloves, and what was I using for pants? Probably the brigand trousers? Yeah, that looks about right. 
Uh, yeah, let's rest the bonfire so I can get the ogre back. I still want him to get me my malformed shell. Just because I, th I think it's a really clever item. They include it in the base game, and yet it has ties to Shulva. It's really strange. I'll show you that in just a second here after I get him low, making sure not to kill him, hopefully. Maybe I get distracted again. It's been known to happen every now and again. Oh. One more hit, and I'll be happy. Yeah. Now you can follow me all the way up here. My good man. It's gonna be... <laughs> His run is so funny. Like that little chubby run. Thank you kindly. One more. One more and I'll be done with you. Come on over here. Gonna do your chubby run? No, just just the little slow walk. There we go. I take the hit. Totally worth. Now, I probably should have used the great axe because it has the full backstab on these guys. Hit him and he's, he's coming up. We trade, but it's totally worth it. He has a chance to drop some really nice items, so I, I like to kill him if given the opportunity. And here we have the malformed shell. This is one of the items that really links Shulva to uh, Aldia and the whole dragon uh, situations that were going on in both cultures. Now, in the base game, this was a very strange looking item. You'd never seen anything like this in the game before. There's no creatures around that have any sort of teeth that look like this. And then, you reach Shulva. And you're piddling about. You finally clear through the first little sanctum area. And then you get all the way down to the bottom, the murky waters below, in the, whatchamacallit, the lair of the imperfect. All those horribly misfigured dragonish substitute things, sort of dragons that never really came to be, those are the imperfect. Inside their mouths, you can actually see their teeth are almost a perfect fit for the malformed shell. That's one of the better sources of evidence that link Aldia to the... Oh, that was a bad idea. Should not have done that. That link Aldia and Dreng Lake as a whole to Shulva. I've been having quite a few discussions on Reddit about the links therein, and plenty of people have been casting doubt one way or another. And so I, I really want to call upon just whatever evidence I can to show that, no, there's a there's a distinctive link here. However the imperfect came about, Aldia had a hand in it. You can find their freaking teeth here in his keep itself. And, again, it's just so clever how they do that. How there's no enemies like that in the base game, but they knew they were going to be releasing the imperfect in the DLC, and so they included the malformed shell, an item that is their teeth. It's a very clear connection. Just as the malformed sh uh, skull is the sort of skull of the enhanced undead type enemies that I just killed back there, so too is the malformed shell a bit of the teeth or skull section ishly thing of the imperfect that can be found down in the bottom of Shulva. Now, I don't claim to know exactly what their anatomy is or why what looks to be their body is considered a shell and why they have those massive teeth, but there you have it. It's, it is a very distinct and clear connection between the two, and it's just really interesting how they set that up beforehand. This boss can be really nice, where he can be the absolute dickens, it really depends on how the boss chooses to fight me. If he's a buddy and stays on the ground stamping his feet, snipping at me now and again, then I should have a very easy time of it. If he's a coward that tries flying, 
flying away and scorching me with fire, then I'm going to be very annoyed. Yeah, I think we know what he's going to be doing. Can you not? Oh dear. <sighs> that attack is one of his few really dangerous ones, as it can stagger you if you get hit, and immediately upon <sighs> immediately upon standing up, you'll get hit again. So if you get caught the first time round, you'll get caught the second time round as well. There we go. Come on down. Stick around. You can stick around. Lovely. That's what we want from you. If we could stop whiffing, at least. Luckily, I do have a nice source of range damage with my bow here. So I can't complain too much about him flying around, but quite often I come here with full melee builds and just have the devil of a time facing the guardian dragon. Occasionally he is really nice and even on full melee builds you can just clip away at his legs while he's sitting there snipping at you, breathing fire in weird ways or just trying to step on you, but eh, it's certainly not a guarantee and I don't want to rely on it at all. The scenery here is pretty great. I mean look at that, they clearly had the ability to make non-repeating textures or at least repeating textures that weren't obvious, but sometimes they just drop the ball. I don't know how to design a game, so I don't really know the logistics behind that, but it, it is kind of sad for me to see either way. I can't necessarily judge them for it, as I don't know what it takes and what they were dealing with, but still, I don't rate it. Come on up here through that extremely long elevator ride really makes you wonder how they built that elevator. Since that's the only real path we know of in order to get up here, it just really makes you question the, logis the logistics of building that elevator in the first place. Especially since it's kind of clear that this is a very mountainous region that really relies on dragons having wings and humans having these rickety little rope bridges to get around, and while I may be wrong, I don't think these rope bridges would have supported all the stone and masonry and tools needed to build the dragon shrine up there. It's not a big gripe, as it, it is a very small, silly little detail, but <laughs> it, it is logistics. Sometimes games have a little bit too much fantasy in them, and this is kind of one of those times. There's no real way that the Dragon Shrine could have been completed if this path through the Dragon Eyrie is in fact the only way up there, which would appear to be the case. This Great Axe is going to do great things for me, since it has that wonderful downward chop, and the damage numbers I'm going to need to kill these Titanite Lizards outright. I don't honestly think that the one-handed chop of the Bastard Sword would kill them in a single swing, so... I'm glad that I have the Lion Great Axe with me in order to handle the job. Oh, thought he was walking forward. Ah, oh. stop repositioning. Oh, I took that for no reason. There we go. It's slow going, but it'll do it. Just. <sighs> You would not expect a lumbering dragon this big to, or drake I suppose, this big to be able to dodge so effectively, but you would be wrong. Uh, none of them are left over. Usually there's at least one or two of the Titanite Lizards around that are, that maybe haven't noticed you. So you can come and clear them up afterwards, but no such luck here. Looks like we're going to have to take another two or three runs up here in order to clear them all out. Which is kind of sad. But, you know, they're really worth it. There's They are such a great reward. Lots and lots and lots of special Titanite and upgrade stones that are so useful, especially end game like this, when you want to start diversifying. Upgrades in general are fairly limited throughout the game. 
with a lot of interesting breakpoints and uh, scarcity all about, but it makes sense. It keeps you using a certain weapon throughout the game. It kind of keeps rewarding you for keeping going, for making progress, clearing certain areas, finding secrets even. So the scarcity of the upgrade stones is actually a really big feature in the game. I've heard some people complaining about it, and a lot of people wish that they would give you a vendor for infinite twinkling and petrified dragon bones, and I, I don't think that would be good for the game. I think that would kind of reduce the scarcity that's there, it, that sort of hyperinflation of what is essentially upgrade currency would kind of undervalue what's already in the game as well as make it so that if you had already farmed it up you you would be losing a lot of relative value in comparison to your Joe Schmo. Oh! I was not expecting the tail slam on that. I thought he was gonna be swinging his head around for a hit but the tail swipe was a little bit of a surprise to me. See, these guys are nice. They don't have reduced damage when you're sw when they're stomping their feet, like the imperfect that I was just talking about. That's how you design an enemy. This is this is good. They lock themselves into an animation. They make sh you make absolutely certain you're not going to get hit, and they take damage for messing up. When they're locked into an animation, when they're stuck in a place where they can't hurt you if you're playing smart, then that is your time to punish them. Whereas with the imperfect, you have to take what you can get at the end of their animations, as well as just kind of make take risks in swinging at them while they're not locked into an animation, which is, I wouldn't say terrible game design, but it really turns on its head the strategies that the game's been teaching you up to that point. And I think that is kind of a theme with the DLCs thus far, is that they kind of take your experience and make you go outside of that in order to adapt to the enemies that are present within the game. Like, in the base game, you come across really large enemies like the old knights and the drake keepers that we're gonna come across a little bit later and how do you deal with them well you circle around behind and you try and swing while they're busy with their other attacks that's the strategy for defeating them that's the sort of algorithm for their defeat whereas you find enemies like the massive smelter hammer wielding enemies the massive bladed mace looking enemies in the DLC, the Iron Crown DLC, that take that strategy and kind of turn it on its head by having little bits of lava spewing out everywhere. They take the strategy you've already learned and kind of break it down. They punish you for circling around while they're busy attacking and getting just free hits off. They really make you a lot more cautious or they punish you for not being cautious. You have to wait for them to spew lava and be in an animation, and then you can circle around, or you could try outranging them, poking them while they're busy doing other things. Certain attacks, you've got to come at them directly from behind or directly from the front. And even behind doesn't always work. Sometimes they even spew out there, if I'm not mistaken. But it, it really changes up how you take on big enemies. And if they were part of the base game, you know, I would probably I would probably think that a bad thing. But these are DLC enemies. This is something you paid extra for to get outside of your initial experience with the game. This is more, this is bonus, this is extra, this is new. And so, if they gave you just more of the same, well, what'd be the point? If I wanted to face more Drake Keepers and more Old Knights, I could play through the base game. But no, they give you something new. They give you different mechanics and different strategies that you have to contend with in the DLC. Look at the... what's my columns? Uh, so, bleh, 
Sanctum Soldiers and Sanctum Knights over in the Sunken Crown DLC. Throughout the whole game, you kind of have to break out of your habits from Dark Souls 1 of just circling around and backstabbing or just getting very simple, easy parries on a lot of enemies. Whereas in the Iron Crown, not the Iron Crown, but the Sunken Crown DLC, you have a lot, and I mean a lot, of really throwaway, arguably trash NPCs, trash mobs, that harken back to the days of Dark Souls 1, where critical hits are incredibly important, and they're going to poise through a lot of your attacks, so you kind of have to either fight them almost solely from range, or be very choosy and selective about how you're going in on them. Circling around, however, is the perfect strategy because they have very little tracking. Even the enemies with the broad sweeping mace attacks don't have the uh, combo potential of some other enemies that would keep you warded away. So you can just roll through their single or double attack and then just get the backstab because they take so long in their recovery. It gives you a new way of playing the game. It's, it's something different. It's something that you don't really have in the base game. Sure, there are certain areas where you can get pretty consistent backstabs. The Scions, for instance, are pretty terrible about shielding their flanks. And it, it is a mechanic that you can abuse pretty much anywhere. But with the Sanctum Soldiers and Knights, it's just given to you. It's kind of like that's what they're intending for. That's how they kind of want you to face these guys because they made it so effective. They gave you a new experience, new way of playing the game, and that's why you buy the DLC. Not to mention there's a bunch of amazing bosses, really, really great level designs, and a whole slew of other really great lore tidbits and additions to the game that really make it worthwhile, but even just the gameplay is so new and different that it really, really recommends itself to me. It, it brings me in and it says to me that this is a product I should be paying money for. This is good. I want this. I want more of this. Give me more of this. Can you do that for me? The answer is yes. Good. Great. Take my money and that's why I have the season pass and I'm going to be getting the Ivory Crown DLC in just about a week now. The other two DLC have just absolutely blown me away. Fantastic. Honestly, some of the highlights of Dark Souls 2. And now they're going to give me another one. And I'm just, I cannot wait. I'm absolutely over the moon about it. There's just so much great things from Software Did with the DLC. They made a wonderful platform in Dark Souls 2. It's a very strong game in its own right. It's got so much better mechanics, wonderful variety, new and improved upgrade systems, leveling, etc. And then they made DLC for it that takes it a step in above and beyond. While the base game had all those great improvements to the systems of the game, the DLCs are some of the best gameplay that can be found in Dark Souls 2. They fix some of the issues that the base game has of mediocre level design and some, I don't know, lackluster enemy types. Not to mention certain issues with farming certain materials. The petrified dragon bones were just absolutely disgusting to have to farm in the base game. And in the DLC, they fix these problems. They take the problems that they have in the base game, and they fix them, they make the game better. It kind of makes me wonder if they would have made a better Dark Souls 2 if they'd had more time in development, but, you know, I don't know. It could well be that it was the input of the community that spur spurred them on to create the wonderful DLC. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> Should have rolled. Should have rolled. I don't know whether... The DLC is good because of the input of the community talking to the developers about the poor-ish level design, some of the problems they had, the lack of farming of Titanites, and 
all these issues, or if they just kind of foresaw that these were going to be an issue and had to rush the product out the door, and so decided to go back over it and sort of fix these issues when they had the ability to make broad sweeping changes to the actual content of the game via their DLC. I honestly can't say one way or another, but I do suspect the latter. I think that they tried to make a great game with Dark Souls 2, and it didn't quite cut the mustard on all fronts. It's I would say that it's even the base game is a better game than Dark Souls 1. Dark Souls 1 has a lot going for it. Wonderful lore, just impeccable level design, and some really great variety and mechanics, but Dark Souls 2 really just shores it up and makes it that much better. It's just such a sweeping improvement across almost every front of the actual gameplay facet that is, I'll be honest, the most important part of Dark Souls for me. I do love the lore. I cherish it. It's one of my favorite pastimes. But I buy the game to play the game, not to hear about the game, not to think about the game. Those are things that are kind of ancillary to the main draw of Dark Souls. I buy it for the incredibly tight gameplay, the challenging enemies, the fluid combat that's just so immersive and satisfying. And that really is the crux of the issue. It's, it's satisfying. This is a game that feels great to play. And that's why it's so popular, in my opinion. Because it's such a tight and just very immersive game. There we go. That should be the kill shot. Bingo. And while Dark Souls 2 d did that much better than Dark Souls 1, and Dark Souls was a vast improvement over Demon Souls, I think Demon Souls has a lot going for it, but it's certainly no Dark Souls. I know some would disagree. I think it does come down to a lot to which game you were exposed to first, which systems you got used to, and which ones you, you're kind of a bigger fan of. Like, I know a German spy had just ungodly amounts of time spent in Dark Souls, I mean, Demon Souls, and then proceeded to play Dark Souls, and now Dark Souls 2, and that's one of the reasons he has such big issues with a lot of the systems and the changes, because they're different than the game that he fell in love with. However, I do think he's blinded by the nostalgia, and can't really see that most of these are improvements. Like, he complains a lot about enemy tracking, and I just, I can't wrap my head around that, because enemy tracking is one of the best additions to the series that they've had since its inception. In Dark Souls 1 and Demon Souls, enemies attacked and they locked themselves into a little animation going in one direction. Occasionally they could uh, change up their direction with further swings, but honestly, once they attacked, they, that was it. They'd blown their load. If they hit you, great, you're staggered, you're gonna take their damage, haha, -ha. punish you for whatever foolish thing you were attempting that got you hit in the first place, but if they missed, then they were so ridiculously vulnerable. They just kind of sat there and took it. That's why in Dark Souls and Demon Souls, backstabbing was such an incredibly useful technique. You could clear through almost the entire population of all the humanoid enemies in both games just by baiting them into an attack, sitting behind a shield even, and once they had attacked, immediately just walk on over behind them, throw out a single attack, and it sucked them into the animation. If you were in just any of a certain area behind the enemy, a certain little cone, I would think, then once you clicked the attack button, the light attack button, they got sucked into a backstab, and you got a ridiculous amount of damage off. Whereas Dark Souls 2 gave you enemies that sort of tracked you. If they were attacking, and you were circling around them, they followed you. They kept attacking at you. And I do understand some people's frustration in that it is a change to the game system. It, it's just like the DLCs. It changes the way you play the game. It f really reduces the effectiveness of strategies that, honestly, you've probably come to rely on. 
just circling around the enemy isn't going to work ten times out of ten anymore if you're just hiding behind your shield and waiting for the backstab. Here in Dark Souls 2, enemies are smart. They aren't just going to keep attacking the air, mostly. They still do that quite a lot, but it's, it's a lot better than it was in Dark Souls and Demon Souls. And that's one of the best changes to the mechanics. The enemies actually fight competently now, rather than just whiffing and just kind of resigning themselves to their fate once they've begun an attack. Now they actually try and hit you, rather than just hit around you a few times because they already decided which way they were going to attack, and by golly, they're sticking to it. They don't care if you move, they're going to stick to their guns. You can see how silly the concept is, if you think about it. That's why tracking was such a great change. It's a new mechanic, it's a new way of interacting with the game that really, really changes the way it works. It incentivizes you to play smarter, play a bit more uh, defensive, play in a way where you punish them for attacking. You don't just circle around. You actually have to interact with the enemy rather than just immediately backstabbing it and nullifying all chances of getting hit. They also changed up how backstabs work even when you manage to get them. Instead of just being during the entire animation you get infinite amounts of health and poise and stamina and all that jazz where, okay not stamina, but where you couldn't be injured at all now they allow attacks at the very beginning of a backstab or repost to do full damage attacks in the middle still apply full buildup such as curse, poison, bleed, etc. and attacks in the middle and end are completely ignored which is a much different mechanic to what they had. Uh, I hate these guys. These are the worst enemies in the entire game that aren't dogs. They have a three hit combo that staggers you horribly and there's very little ways to deal with them in melee. I'm gonna just come out and say it. These are a poorly designed enemy. A lot of people complain about the mace wielding drake keepers and I get that. They are frustrating because they do keep swinging if you stand in front of them. But all that should tell you is don't stand in front of them. It's not like it's a big issue because a lot of their other attacks, if you're at their side or behind them, are going to lock them up for a really long time during which you can punish them horribly by just swinging away at their back and sides. With... There we go. With those... Halberd wielding, I suppose it's a Drake Great Hammer, but it, it uses the Halberd moveset. So, with the Halberd wielding uh, enemies, they don't have that same weakness. Running around behind them is going to get you clipped and staggered to infinita infinity, basically, and you're just going to eat a ridiculous amount of damage, and there's no real way to deal with them from range effectively because they often have their shields up and there's just so much wrong with them especially when you have to face two of them right next to each other who does that gosh it's so frustrating it's very very annoying dark souls 2 isn't perfect i I'm, i never said it is i'm just saying that it's the best that we've had so far okay getting getting a little bit of a more decent amount of stats in there now. Let's unhollow me and now I have the Ashen Mist Heart. I can finally head on and take on Broom Tower. I always like to grab the Ashen Mist Heart before I go there just so I can clear it all in one go as I am want to do. It allows me to head straight onto a lawn once I'm ready for him and that's how I like to take this area on. Just as I like to take on Sholva when I'm in that interim between all the four great old ones and Dragonlight Castle. It's just it's the perfect timing in the game for me to be taking that on. Thank you so much for watching. I'm looking forward to playing through this next DLC again. And here's hoping that the Ivory Crown blows me away just as much as these first two.
Have a nice day, everybody.